All right, there we go. All right. And I'm, uh, thank you all for being here today. My name is Kim Laney. I'm the Ollie coordinator. And uh, we welcome you to our brown bag lunch presentation on brain health tips to keep your brain healthy with Megan Gallagher from Area One Agency on Aging. Um, and we want to thank all of our friends of Ollie for making these brown bag lunch presentations possible. Um, they, we hope you enjoy, enjoy today's presentation, and um, we want to let you know that Ollie membership is open to anyone age 50 and better, and um, if you are interested in being an Ollie member, we hope that you will join today. Um, Ollie membership is a, an investment in lifelong learning and creating the community in which we want to live. The success and growth of Ollie is a reflection of the incredible community of members, volunteers, and faculty, and friends of Ollie. As of today, we have 430 members. Um, that's five more than we had last week, and so I'm super happy for those five new members who joined us. And we hope that if you're not an Ollie member, that you will join and help us reach our goal of 1,000 members by June of 2022. We have heard that some folks were not interested in um, being an Ollie member until we were having face-to-face -face classes again. And so I'm happy to let you know that we are um, able to offer some face-to-face -face classes or in-person classes. And so you'll see a lot more of those in the winter and um, spring schedule. So um, please, please join or invite a friend to join. Um, for now, if you'll go ahead and mute yourself, as I mentioned earlier, that will be super helpful. And um, Megan will take questions. I, I'm, I'll ask you to confirm that, Megan, but as you go is typically the way that um, we have done that before. Um, and I'll go ahead and turn that over to Jane so she can uh, introduce Megan for us. Thanks, everybody. And we're delighted to have all of you here to listen to Megan Gallagher, who is the Information and Assistance Manager for the Area One on Aging. Uh, prior to joining the agency almost three years ago, she worked in the assisted living field. She got her start as an advocate for older adults as a teenager after her grandfather had a stroke and has worked in the industry her whole life. She's given three prior presentations that have been excellent. We're looking forward to this one. Megan, it's all yours. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me here again today. I'm gonna have to start switching up my bio. So, you know, it's not just the same thing every time. Okay, so today I am here to talk to you about brain health. Ignore the current screen. Oops, no, let's get to the beginning. How about that? There we go. Okay. So brain health, and we're gonna go over kind of tips to slow the loss of brain function. Um, so before I get into that, I want to throw it out to anyone who was here last month for my presentation, um, new to 60. One of the things that I had talked about was something called a death book. And I had promised that resource to everyone. Um, and that, that promise has not, come to fruition yet. I apologize. Um, you know, when I did the presentation, I had the slides, but I didn't actually have any sort of book created. And so I have been working on getting that created. And as soon as I get it finished, I will absolutely get it off to the Ollie world so you guys can access it. Um, and so I, I appreciate your patience. Um, so as Jane mentioned, I work for the Area One Agency on Aging. I do want to throw out that we have now moved offices. That's part of the reason why I'm delayed with the, the death book was we moved the day after I gave my presentation last month. So if any of you are looking for us, we are now at 333 J Street, still in Eureka. We're right across from the courthouse. It's the corner of 4th and J. Um, so today I'm going to talk about kind of how aging affects your brain function, what some of those common changes are that you'll see as you age. I have a quick video. I'm not really going to get into dementia or Alzheimer's or any, any kind of thing like that today, but just a very quick video to kind of show you what the difference looks like between normal aging and dementia. Um, and then we're going to talk about kind of the three top ways to slow the loss of brain function and spoiler alert, that's going to be your diet, exercising your brain and exercising your body. 
So I personally have been to talk after talk about brain health and what you should do and everything like that. And what I find is so often these talks focus on the studies. This study shows this and this study shows that and this percentage of this and that. And by the time the talk's over, they mention like, oh yeah, your diet affects your brain brain function, but they never actually get into specifics of what about your diet affects your brain function or what are some concrete steps I can start doing today to you know affect my, my brain function. And so that's what I really wanted to focus this talk on was giving you guys some concrete things that you could walk away with after this presentation. Everything that I have put into this presentation has been studied and has been proven through multiple studies. Um, and if you really love to read scientific papers, I you know could email you a list of, of ones that I referenced when I was kind of doing a little more research to get my numbers right for this presentation. Okay. So first, I just want to kind of talk about when we age, what happens? Um, and when I say aging, I don't mean, you know, when you're 90 years old. So um, studies have shown that your brain peaks around 25 or 30. It's all downhill from there. Um, and then at about in your 30s or 40s, your actual brain volume begins to shrink as well. Then kind of right around the 60 year old mark, that rate of increase jumps up. So now it's shrinking at a, at a higher rate. And what they've seen is that it's your prefrontal cortex, your cerebellum and your hippocampus that are kind of shrinking the most. And all three of those play a huge part in memory and cognition, things like that. Um, so they also see that your neurons shrink, they retract their dendrites, um, and the fatty, I should have looked up this word before my presentation, myelin, I'm going to think is roughly how you pronounce that, um, deteriorates, your synapses between your cells decrease, and then the formation of neur new neurons decrease. And so what all of that means is you're going to see some changes in your brain and in your brain function that are absolutely normal with aging. Okay. And so some of these things that we see are, it's slower to find words, you're slower to recall names. So my grandma, who's 95, doing pretty darn good for 95, gets through about all like 16 um, grandchildren before she gets to the correct name, you know, when she's talking to me. Um, or if she's talking about my grandpa, she'll say dad instead of, you know, your, your dad instead of your grandfather doesn't mean she has Alzheimer's, that's totally normal. Um, you'll see some increased problems with multitasking. So, you know, when you were 30 and working in a high function, you know, business setting, you were able to talk on the phone and, and type an email and, you know, do something else all at the same time. And now all of a sudden, even when you're fully focused on your phone conversation, you find yourself losing your train of thought. Um, your decrease in the ability to pay attention for, you know, and it's especially like extended periods of time, um, the increase. So it basically the time it takes to process new information and respond. And so the best example of this is driving. And it's one of the reasons why older adults get a bad rep for being, you know, not as not great drivers is, you know, if someone cuts you off the um, the the processes are a little bit slower for you to kind of realize and react by put putting on your brakes and then it takes a little more practice to learn a new skill okay so these things if they're happening to you it doesn't mean you're senile or anything like that it's unfortunately just your the the chemical imbalance and all of this biology stuff that i talked about that's going on in your brain okay so i have a quick video this is a woman named Tipa Snow. If you ever do want to do some more research on dementia or Alzheimer's, I highly recommend looking up Tipa Snow. I love her. And I think she's the best person out there right now that really kind of explains some of the behaviors and gives concrete ways of how to handle them. So 
this is a very bad video and I apologize for it. It's unfortunately the only free version I could get off the internet. Um, so bear with me. And it's gonna be her kind of comparing what normal aging looks like and dementia. If I can get the video to play. There we go. Yeah, because the reason it works when we're forgetful is our brains aren't there. So let me show you the difference between forgetful and having dementia. And let's see if it, it's familiar to anybody. Are you ready? Here's how it starts. I'm in the living room and I decide, I decide, you know what? I've been watching TV. I'm getting thirsty. I am going to go make a pot of coffee because I want some coffee for this. What am I going to do? So I get out and I head toward the kitchen. And I said, yeah, I'm going to go make coffee. But before I can get all the way to the kitchen, tell them. So I stopped to answer the telephone. Hello? Oh, hey, baby. Huh? No good to hear from. Huh? Oh, sure. I'd love to get together. Oh, okay. This afternoon? Yeah, yeah. What time? Two? Okay. Where? At the mall? Yeah, okay. Well, which end? Yeah, by Macy. Okay, you want to meet inside or out? Out, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Okay, well, that's fine. Huh? Oh, yeah, they opened that chocolate store, didn't they? Oh, sure. Oh, no, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah. You get coconut, I'll get caramels. We'll share. Half the calorie. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> huh? Oh, no, I'll call Margaret and see she wants to come. Sure. No, that's fine. Huh? Oh. Oh, the vacation pictures? Yeah, I'll bring them. Wait until you see yourself in that face. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm not really. <laughs> All right, sweetheart. All right, well, I'll see you soon. Okay, that too. All right. Love you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Huh. What did I come in here for? And I look around, and it's like, son, I look now, when I was 25, I could have looked around and it would have come to me, but not in the kitchen. Not anymore. I should go, okay, wait a minute, where was it? I'm living. Go back to living. And I was sitting as I sit down. Why could I not remember this? This is ridiculous. I want to come. This is, I am losing it. Now, notice everyone in this room has gotten incredibly quiet. <laughs> because all of you go, oh shit, I have this. <laughs> you do, you do. It's called senile forgetfulness. It is getting worse. You peaked at 25. It's been downhill ever since. <laughs> well, no, uh -uh. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Here's what happens I have a thought. And what I do when I have a thought, I want to make coffee. What I do is I put it in working memory. Now, working memory is a really important part of your brain because it allows you to stay focused on a task or hold multiple pieces of information in your brain at one time. Here's the bad news. It's very small. It can only hold about five to eight chunks of information at a time. It allows you to multitask, to organize, to plan, to do things. So I put coffee in that working memory and I go to make coffee. But before I can make the coffee, what happens? Telephone rings. If Betty had just said hi, bye, I could still make coffee. But Ben's Betty. She wants to meet today at two o'clock at the mall, down by Macy's, outside. We're gonna go eat chocolate. Well, I'm not gonna call. Margaret, what will I not have with me? Pictures. Pictures. Why? Too many things, I lost them. Now, those of you who've been living with forgetfulness for a while, what have you started putting right next to the telephone? Yeah. No pad. And if it's happened for a good long while, you have tied the pencil on. <laughs> because if not, you walk off and then the next time you don't have anything to write with. Okay. Here's what happens though. Where's coffee? Long gone, it got dumped out because of all the stuff that Betty wanted to talk about. Here's what I can do at 25. Is everyone, real quick, I just wanted to check, is everyone having difficulty hearing or was it just Patricia? No. I, I could not understand a word. Yeah. Very yeah. hard to understand. Neither could I. Okay. Okay. Then I, I'll stop playing it um, if you guys can't hear it. But basically what she does is she's acting out what normal aging would look like versus dementia. And with normal aging, it's absolutely normal. You know, she was saying that you can really only store about five to eight things in your working memory. 
Um, and so she was sitting down, she wanted a cup of coffee. She got up, but before she got to the kitchen, her friend called and they talked about a bunch of things. So she hung up the phone and of course then forgot why she had stood up and what she was supposed to be doing. Um, and if we were to keep watching it with the dementia, so that was her example of normal aging. Dementia is she kind of never gets back. Um, you know, so with normal aging, she was able to walk back to her chair and be like, oh, that's right. I, I wanted a cup of coffee. And with dementia, you can't pick up on those same cues. Um, and so you kind of just go off of visual cues and can get sucked into this circle of just, you know, looking at one thing and, and focusing on that and so on and so forth. So again, talk is not going to focus on dementia. So um, basically we want to focus on what normal aging is and how we can possibly slow the loss of, you know, your brain function when it comes to normal aging. And so kind of the top three things that are action items that you can start doing today would be changing your diet, exercising your brain and exercising your body. And we're going to get into each one of these. So you know, kind of what steps you can start taking. And so with changing your diet, um, you, you might have heard of either the DASH diet or the Mediterranean diet. Both of those have been around for a really long time. The DASH diet is the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. So that's that heart healthy diet, um, that they advertise on like the Cheerio box and things like that. It includes foods that are really rich in potassium, calcium, magnesium, and then lowers or limits foods that are high in sodium, saturated fats, and added sugars. The Mediterranean diet, it mimics um, eating habits of people around the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, so that focuses on, you know, a ton of fruits, veggies, whole grains, um, and limits your processed foods, added sugar, and refined grains. So studies have shown that both the DASH diet and the Mediterranean diet are good for you. And, you know, so many of the health systems are interconnected with one another. So if you lower your hypertension, you are also lowering your chances of having cognitive impairment. And so they were like, okay, wow, these two diets seem to have some effect on cognitive impairment and decrease you know, your, your chances of losing some of that impairment. Um, we want to really study something that is brain specific. And so they created what's known as the mind diet, which kind of takes the DASH diet, merges it with the Mediterranean diet, and then stands for interventions for neurodegenerative disease. I can't, or delay, sorry. Um, and so that's the diet that we're really going to focus on today. And it includes, you know, vegetables that is supposed to be whole grains, not who grains, um, berries, nuts, legumes, fish, poultry, and my favorite wine. Um, but at the same time, you're limiting kind of five main foods, red, red meat, fried food, cheese, pastries and sweets, and then butter and margarine. Okay. So with the mind diet, as I mentioned, it was specifically created to help prevent dementia and slow the loss of brain function. The really great thing is that there's no super strict requirements to follow. Instead, it focuses on these 10 really good foods and five really bad foods. And so you just want to eat more of the good stuff and less of the bad stuff. Um, which makes it so much easier to follow because unlike, you know, things like the keto diet and all those Atkins and things like that, where you cheat once and you throw off your whole system, this is not the case with the mind diet. So the first kind of good food is green leafy vegetables. And with green leafy vegetables, you wanna be aiming for six or more servings per week. Um, and I put the serving side in each of these. I will email these slides to Jane um, so you guys don't feel like you have to, you know, write everything down. 
you can access them from the slides. But um, for this, one serving is either two cups of uncooked greens or one cup of cooked greens. And the reason these are so great is because they're a good source of vitamin K, folate, and beta carotene. Um, so there's more than just what I listed here. You know, there's also chard and um, arugula. Basically, think any leafy green falls into this category. The second really good food would be any other vegetable. And you want to aim for at least having one serving of that vegetable in addition to your leafy greens on a daily basis. Um, and here, one serving means one, one cup of uncooked vegetables or half a cup of cooked vegetables. While all veggies are great, non-starchy are the best. Um, so picking carrots over potatoes and that sort of thing. And then also trying to do brightly colored vegetables because they're rich in antioxidants. So um, you've probably heard like eat a colorful plate and that definitely falls true here. Don't just eat a bunch of green things. Um, you know, throw in some beets and some carrots with your greens and kind of eat, eat the rainbow. Um, the next thing is berries. So berries are really rich in polyphenols that protect your neuron health. They also have a lot of antioxidants in them as well. Um, a lot of the studies have focused on blueberries and strawberries. So they have been proven to kind of have that great benefit, um, but all berries are kind of clumped into this and they all have antioxidants. So they're all good for you. Um, with berries, you're wanting to eat about three servings per week. And in this case, one serving equals one cup. Then we have nuts. Um, and so for nuts, they say to eat about five or more servings per week. And um, one serving size is a quarter cup or one ounce, whichever is easier to measure out. Um, eating a wide range of nuts. So if you love almonds, great, but just don't eat five servings of almonds in the week, you know, mix it up and get some pecans or pistachios or something else in there. And what nuts do is they lower high blood pressure and your bad cholesterol. Then they say olive oil is going to be your best bet in terms of kind of your, your fatty cooking um, option. So anytime you're cooking, trying to cook with olive oil, um, they say extra virgin olive oil is the best, but olive oil in general is still gonna be better than your vegetable oil or something like that. Um, and as much as possible, trying to also replace it with butter and margarine. Um, so kind of dipping your bread in oil and herbs rather than lathering it with butter. And it is a good source of the mono unsaturated fat, which is kind of what's called the good fat. And it helps reduce inflammation, promotes healthy blood function. Okay, with whole grains. Um, so whole grains are going to be anything that's 100% whole wheat, pastas, breads, you know, um, anything like that. It also includes oatmeal, quinoa, brown rice, that sort of thing. And you're aiming for three servings per day with one serving being either just a single slice of bread or half a cup of cooked grains. And it is a really good source of dietary fiber. Number seven would be fish. And I know, I feel like fish is one of those things that people either love it or they hate it. I am lucky enough to love it. So two servings a week of fish, I'm like, no problem. I could eat two servings of fish a day and, you know, probably a mercury poisoning, but otherwise be fine. Um, so I know that, you know, for certain people out there, this one's going to be a struggle, but trying to fit it in there. And if you're going to force yourself to eat fish, um, choosing the fatty fish. So salmon, I think is the most popular kind of thing that pops into people's heads when they think healthy fatty fish, but mackerel, tuna, sardines, and herring are also kind of grouped into that. Um, and one serving would be six to eight ounces of uncooked fish. It's a great source for omega-3 
and you know DHA and EPA and I should have spelled out what those two stand for because I no longer remember them off the top of my head. Um, so, okay, I, I have a question or an answer here about um, what about gluten issues with the grains? And, you know, that's one of the things that um, when we get to the five bad foods, I tried to put some like, hey, what should you eat instead? With the good foods, it would be, you know, subbing it with kind of whatever you would naturally sub it with. Um, and just trying to really focus on avoiding those five bad foods um, and, and kind of eating the rest of the nine good foods if you're not able to eat um, gluten. Because unfortunately, there's not a great substitute that has been studied enough that I'd feel confident saying, hey, you can skip, skip the grains and instead eat this. Um, and with ghee, I believe that would still fall into the butter and margarine. Um, and so while it might not be as horrible as, you know, processed margarine, it's still going to be on the, the avoid list. Um, dairy is kind of in general, um, not, not super great with this diet. And so like cheese, well, when we get to it, cheese is on the bad list. Um, it doesn't specifically talk about like milk and, and the rest of dairy products besides cheese and butter. Um, but I would say if, if at all possible. Okay, yeah, and so rice and quinoa, I'm saying, Linda's saying those are gluten-free. I'm horrible when it comes to the gluten and no gluten diet. I mean, I was attempting to do a gluten-free diet and I, I had to like Google everything. Um, but yeah, there are definitely a lot of gluten-free options with breads and pastas now. So, you know, it's, it's something that you can substitute with relatively easily. Um, so poultry that includes either chicken or turkey, as long as it is not fried, they're saying go for three or more servings per week with one serving being three to four ounces cooked. Um, and it's a healthier protein choice in this case than red meat. Legumes are also on the list, um, which includes all beans, um, soybeans, lentils, everything like that. And you're wanting to aim for four or more servings per week with one serving being a quarter cup uncooked and half a cup cooked. And it's packed with the, the kind of the, the good carbs, the low glycemic carbs and protein. Um, soy milk would count, yes. So you could kind of count that in as your, your servings. Um, and then, oh, did I? Okay, no. 10 is wine, which I think is amazing. That what diet do you ever find that includes wine? Um, so the big kicker here is it's one per day. There's no catching up. There's no like, okay, well, one per day means I get seven glasses per week. So I'm going to have three glasses tonight, but then I won't have two, you know, any, any for the next two nights. Um, and it's also sticking to kind of the serving size, which is five ounces for wine. So you can't just pour yourself, you know, one of those giant glasses that can fit the whole bottle. Um, they, red wine has definitely kind of tested the best in studies, um, but basically what alcohol does in moderation is it increases levels of the HDL cholesterol, which is that good cholesterol, um, but there's a, a very thin line. So in moderation, one drink a day, you're fine, it's, it's benefiting you. But as soon as you kind of cross over that threshold, then it actually decreases your good cholesterol and, do, and has the opposite effect. Um, so serving size, five ounces for wine, whether that's red or white, 12 ounces for a beer and an ounce and a half if it's gonna be a spirit. So now switching and looking at the bad foods, everything that's on kind of this bad list is there because it contains high levels of unhealthy saturated fats and or refined sugars. And basically eating, and this is true for kind of any, any diet, 
you know, eating high quantities of things with, with saturated fats and refined sugars will or could potentially lead to diabetes, high cholesterol, heart disease, and high blood pressure. And that's kind of known as what's, what's called a metabolic syndrome. Okay. And so what the studies have shown is that if you have metabolic syndrome, meaning you have one or more of those diseases, then you increase your risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. Okay. Um, so our first thing on the bad list, which we kind of have touched on is, is butter and margarine. And they say to aim for less than one tablespoon daily. So yeah, crossing the threshold gets more slippery with age. Um, yeah, yeah, just the alcohol and kombucha. I mean, I feel like that's true at any age. You know, if you, if you haven't drank, you know, in a while, that, that one glass of wine will feel it a lot more than if you've been having a glass, you know, every couple of days. And then it also is true that, you know, if, if you're on medications, a lot of medications kind of increase the effects of alcohol as well. So I guess I should make that blanket statement of if your doctor has advised you not to drink, or if you're on medications that don't play well with alcohol, please don't start drinking and be like, Megan said it was fine. She said, as long as I only had one glass, it'd be, it'd be okay. Always go by the doctor has precedent over what I'm telling you. If, if they've said you shouldn't eat gluten, don't start eating gluten just because I'm saying it's on the mind diet. Um, so again, you know, trying to, to sub in olive oil as much as possible instead of margarine. Um, and, I, you know, this is my personal thing of research I have done just on like general health is I would say, you know, I've a lot of things say butter is actually healthier than margarine. Um, because it's more of a true fat and margarine is that like processed. Um, so I would say if you're going to cheat, cheat with butter, not margarine, but that's my, my two cents, my personal two cents. Um, so then we have cheese, which would be the hardest thing for me. I love cheese and I could eat like a wheel of brie myself and just be totally happy with life. Um, but they are saying less than one serving of cheese a week and one serving is a measly 1.5 ounce, which doesn't even get you a grilled cheese sandwich. Um, and I really, I researched hard to be like, okay, well, what could we eat that would like substitute for cheese? And the best I could come up with was cashew cheese and nutritional yeast. And I can tell you from personal experience that neither of those actually taste like cheese, but you know, I, I guess you could try cashew cheese. It, it was interesting. I'll, I'll give it that much. Um, so the third thing on the bad list is red meat. So with red meat, they're saying to aim for no more than one serving per week. So you're not having to cut it out completely. You could still have that steak once a week. Um, and one serving equals five ounces. All, okay, Lynn is saying almond milk cheese is pretty good. I haven't tried that, so I'll have to add it to my list. Um, and Susan is, is mentioning that obviously dairy is recommended for osteoporosis. And so again, that kind of goes with the, go by what your doctor says, don't go by what I say. You know, if you have osteoporosis and your you know, doctor's telling you to drink milk, absolutely drink milk. Um, and don't stop that, you know, and, and again, it kind of goes back to this diet is more of kind of a lifestyle thing and not that strict, you must weigh out your food and you must count, you know, to make sure you're only eating 17 nuts. It's, it's really a incorporate what you can follow it the best you can. Um, and you know, if there's certain aspects of it that don't apply to you, that's fine. Um, Andrea, un unfortunately, all cheeses are the same rate. So um, it, it means none. But um, instead of red meat, going back to that, um, one serving would be five ounces. And they're saying in instead sub it with fish, turkey, chicken, or tofu, and just kind of working more of that into your diet. Um, 
Okay, and so Linda's mentioning that there's way more calcium in broccoli and other vegetables than in dairy. Um, so yogurt, nothing I could find really said avoid yogurt, but again, a lot of this is, is just heavy on the no, no dairy, um, really just kind of limiting your dairy in, in intake in general. Um, so, I, you know, I would say everything in moderation. Um, so the fifth bad thing is fried food. And for this one, they're saying once a month, special occasion, you can have yourself some fried food. And if you are going to eat something fried, make it a, a homemade fried food rather than the restaurant. And I couldn't find anything to explain why. I think it must just be like the oils the restaurants use or something like that. Um, but if you haven't discovered an air fryer yet in the pandemic, now is your opportunity. Um, get yourself an air fryer and you can make all sorts of things that are delicious, um, you know, or baking in the oven. And those are both healthier alternatives to deep frying something. And then finally, we have sugary foods, which you're not supposed to have more than once weekly. And this includes basically everything delicious, um, ice cream, cookies, brownies, donuts, candy, anything that's processed, anything that has added sugar in it. Um, and there are so many things that have added sugar in it if you start reading, reading recipe or um, ingredient labels. So um, some good alternatives. And I can say that berries and sweet potatoes have had the most success for me when I have tried to cut out sugary foods. Um, I just don't, I don't know if beans would do it for me if I'm craving something sugary, but berries have that natural sugar in them. So they're great. Um, you know, anytime I have tried to diet and been on no sugar, I've always, I've always made sure to have berries in my fridge to kind of curb that craving. Um, and then yeah, sweet potatoes just kind of have that natural um, sweetness to it as well. So, you know, again, and I'm going to kind of talk about this at the end, this goes for all three categories is do what you can. Um, so especially with the mind diet, basically the, the biggest study that was done, um, with the mind diet kind of put the participants into three tiers um, with each tier, meaning how well they followed the diet. So tier one, let's say they said they followed the diet like 10% of the time. Tier two, they followed it about 50% of the time. And tier three, they followed it like 75% of the time. Um, the 75% that, you know, followed it the most obviously saw the, the, the most benefits but even that group in the lowest tier that was only following the diet 10% of the time, they still saw a decrease or an, a decrease in the slowing of their memory function. Um, coffee benefits are harmful. That's one, I mean, nothing with the mind diet mentions coffee. Um, so, I, you know, I know that it's kind of a mixed bag out there. Some, some people say that coffee is healthy because it increases your metabolism and then others, you know, caffeine's bad for you. Um, I would say if you're a coffee drinker, don't feel like you have to cut it out, but if you don't drink coffee, there's no need to start. Um, so the next topic after diet would be um, exercising your brain, okay? And when I mention like brain exercises or brain games, or, you know, kind of use any of those generic terms, what I mean is any activity that is engaging your cognitive skills. Um, and then I should have put executive function kind of right under that because they say the best exercises are exercises that are kind of stimulating two or more executive functions. And what they mean by executive function would be your mental processes that help you plan, focus your attention, remember instructions and juggle multiple tasks. Um, so it kind of gives you the ability to monitor and adapt your behavior in order to meet your set goals, as opposed to just 
following the, the yellow brick road, regardless of where it takes you. Um, so the other thing you really want to do when you're picking out brain exercises is you want to find the right level of skill. You don't want to do something that is so easy. You don't have to use your brain to, to figure it out, but you don't want to do something that's so challenging. It's going to stress you out or cause you anxiety or upset you because then it will have the negative effect. So really finding kind of that Goldilocks of skill level. Um, you also want to change up the exercises you do. So if you love crosswords, awesome, that's great. But don't just say, hey, I'm gonna do 12 crosswords a day and, and that's gonna keep me from you know, losing any brain function is you really wanna kind of alternate what you're doing. The same as like, think of your brain as a, as a muscle. So if you wanna beef up your biceps, you do your basic bicep curl. You know, and if that's all you do day in and day out, sure, your, your bicep's going to get stronger, but it's not going to be as great as if you do other exercises that, that uh, work your bicep. And you can tell that I'm not a big exercise person that I can't off the top of my head, think of another, another bicep exercise. Um, so back to our brain exercises, I have a couple slides listing some um, exercises. This is by no means an all-inclusive list. I just put it out there to give you guys some ideas. Um, so Sudoku, um, that is a great one because you're, you're kind of doing multiple things. You're adding numbers and you're solving a puzzle. Um, chess, that is incorrect. Hold on one second. Let me look at my, wait. Okay, I skipped a slide. That's what's going on. So let's back it up and start at the beginning of the list, jigsaw puzzles. puzzles. Um, and I'm still feeling like I messed something up here. I copied a slide and I think what happened is I did not edit all of the text on it. Um, so jigsaw puzzles are great because they use your visual and special work, working memory skills. So you're having to identify a unique shaped piece, remember what that unique shaped piece is looking like and you know match it somewhere. There's tactile hobbies. I put model building and knitting as two examples. There are multiple, multiple tactile hobbies out there. Um, but the key to them is they kind of follow a procedural memory, which includes you, you're understanding the instructions or the steps, you're then remembering those steps and you're performing kind of a sequence of actions. Um, card games, and this is generic. I mean, I'm sure there might be one or two card games out there that use more brain function than others, but card games in general, um, you're kind of, have multiple things going on in your brain. You're having to remember which cards have been played. You're having to develop a strategy. You're remembering like what the cards in your hand mean and following kind of a complex point system depending on the game. Another great thing is dance moves. So um, learning dance, I mean, music in general has been shown just countless to be great all, all around for mood, for memory, for just kind of about everything under the sun. Um, but putting dance to it is you're having to mimic, you know, body movements and you're having to pair that up with the tempo of the music. And so kind of a whole lot of different brain functions are going on with that. Um, so then the next one would be Sudoku. And this is where I messed up. So that uses visual spatial working memory skills. It was left over from jigsaws. Um, and the Sudoku is, you know, memory and numbers. And then chess, which I, the model building is obviously left over from the other slide. So I apologize. Um, but chess uses a couple different things. I mean, it's, it's usually like the number one board game when people think of as like a memory, memory game that you could play or a memory board game because each piece does something different. So there's a lot of kind of remembering the rules and stuff like that. Um, crosswords are always a good go-to. They stimulate the de development of memory and attention skills, and then also kind of increase that ability to find new words. 
And if you're like me, it also includes um, a learning piece because I usually cannot solve the entire crossword puzzle. So I have to look up some of the answers and then I learn new things. Um, which brings us to our next one, learning in general. If it's a new skill, if it's a musical instrument, if it's a language, whatever it is, learning basically brings in multiple kind of areas of your brain. And so it's gonna strengthen that connectivity. It's just all around a good idea. Learn something new every day. You know, that's one of the sayings out there in the world. So um, kind of some more abstract memory games that you, you might not have heard of is something that tests your recall. So an example is, you know, you people watch. You're sitting on the park bench and you spot a person and you say, okay, that person's wearing a brown hat. They're carrying a purse. They're wearing shorts and they have blonde hair. And you make four observations about that person. You repeat them back to yourself. And then in a couple minutes, you say, okay, that person was, you know, wearing a hat, carrying a purse. My, uh, my test, my recall is not very well. What else did I already say? Um, had blonde hair and was wearing shorts. And so you do that after so many minutes and then kind of increase the varying length of time and see if you can keep remembering your four observations. You can also, if four observations is too simple for you, you could do, you know, six or whatever you want to do. Um, same thing with math games. There's all sorts of different kind of games that you can play in your head that will um, kind of keep it functioning regarding math. So just one I put in here is the add three, subtract seven game. So you start by picking any three digit number. So for this example, I started with 321. So you take that number, you add three to it, and you get 324. And then you subtract seven, and you get 317. And you keep going with this. So then you would take the 317, and you'd add three and get 320, and then subtract seven, and so on and so forth, um, until you hit zero or get as close to zero as you can. Drawing maps from memory. So this could be any place new that you visit and it could be kind of like any scale. So you go into a new grocery store that you're not familiar with. You could go home and you could kind of draw the layout of the grocery store. Um, if you expand that, you could say, okay, you, you attended a new mall or you went to a new mall. Um, and so you could draw it out in terms of what stores came where. Um, you no, know, Lori, calculators are not allowed pen and paper are not even allowed with math games. And let me tell you how nervous I was typing in this math example, being like, oh my gosh, I'm doing this with my brain. What if I get it wrong? Um, and so no one has commented on that yet. So hopefully I got my numbers right. Um, but drawing, I mean, it could be really anything. You go to a new neighborhood, kind of drawing streets. You go to someone's house for the first time and you draw the layout of the house, the, the whatever it is, the key is, you know, when you get back to your house and that could be a varying length of time, depending on how far the visit was, you go ahead and you just draw a map and you don't have to be an artist. It can be a very simple kind of stick figure sort of map. Um, but it's really just kind of working out that spatial, you know, um, aspect in addition to your memory. And then there are umpteen brain game kind of websites and apps and things like that nowadays that you could use. Um, I know Jane personally has used the Brain HQ before. Um, and Jane, you could always speak to that, but I think she would definitely recommend it to others. I have tried out Luminosity before, and you know, it was it was pretty cool. Um, I think after I had a free trial or something like that, and it wasn't something that I wanted to pay for because that is kind of the offset. Some of them are free indefinitely. Some of them you can access certain games for free. Some of them you have to pay for. The really cool thing about these apps is they take all of this science that we have learned and all of these studies and put it into the app. And so it automatically kind of alternate your brain games and it picks games for you or, or has games that access different parts of your brain. 
So you're really kind of working the whole picture and don't accidentally focus on, you know, games that just, you know, work your memory or your recall or something like that. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know, you know, if people have used specific game apps or websites that they really like, feel free to add them in the chat. So everyone kind of knows about them. Um, but then we also have exercising your body. And so physical exercise, it helps memory and thinking kind of both directly and indirectly. Um, so Deborah says she has an app that's free called Elevate. Um, yeah, and so that's the other good thing about those apps is they, they remind you to play every single day. Because I mean, doing these exercises, unless it's kind of already part of your life or part of your hobbies, you forget. And then it's like all of a sudden it three months have gone by and you haven't done any of your brain games. Um, so kind of those little reminders always help. Um, but physical exercise directly, it helps your brain because it stimulates the release of chemicals that affect the health of brain cells, the growth of new blood vessels, and the abundance and survival of new brain cells. Okay. Then indirectly, it also improves your mood and sleep. It while it kind of at the same time reduces your stress and anxiety. And so if you're not getting enough sleep, or if you're just kind of in a, a bummer mood all the time, um, then you're going to have kind of some or higher risk of cognitive impairment. And same thing if you're really stressed or, you know, stressed a lot of the time, really anxious, that also can contribute to cognitive impairment. Um, something that I don't have listed here, but you know, also we briefly touched about with diet is indirectly physical exercise is going to keep you overall healthier. It's going to reduce your risk of diabetes and hypertension and all those other bad diseases out there in the world. And by turn, the overall healthier you are, the healthier your brain is going to be as well. Um, so people who exercise regularly have been shown to have greater volume in the parts of brain that control your thinking and memory. So what I couldn't find definitively was a study that, you know, like people who exercise regularly, sure, they have greater volume in the parts of their brain, but it's such a hard thing to focus in that the regular exercise was really kind of what did that, you know, they might have been, there's, there's so many variable factors that can kind of increase or affect it, um, but regular exercise is just never gonna be a bad thing. And the type of exercise matters. So they say you really wanna do that cardiovascular exercise. And while resistance or balance muscle exercises and training are, you know, they're not bad for you, they're not going to have the same impacts on your brain function as cardiovascular exercises. Um, the other thing is the intensity. So you're going for moderate intensity, you know, that's something that gets your heart pumping to the point where you break out in a light sweat. So you want to make sure it's difficult enough that it, you're struggling a little bit, but you shouldn't be huffing and puffing, turning red in the face, not able to catch your breath and kind of sweating buckets. Um, a good kind of concrete goal would be aiming for 30 minutes of exercise five days a week or 150 minutes per week. So sometimes, you know, schedules, life happens. You don't have the 30 minutes each day, but you could do longer exercises, fewer days. Or you could split that up and do shorter exercises all seven days. If you don't feel like you could do 150 minutes per week right now off the gate, it is okay to start lower and do what you feel like you can without overtaxing yourself and then just aim to increase. So even if you feel like the only thing you could do is 10 minutes a day, then you know next week, see if you could do 12 minutes or 15 minutes um, and just really trying to increase that amount. The other thing that I love is household activities. They will absolutely count. 
mopping. Okay, you have not mopped as intensely as I do. I will be breaking out in a sweat or I have a giant fluffy white dog. So therefore everything is covered in a long white dog hair. So I break out in a sweat vacuuming because I am like intensely trying to go over the same spot 72 times to get every inch of dog hair up. Um, you know, so for those people that are in great shape, you might not break a sweat mopping and you might have to do, you know, something a little more intense. Um, but if you find yourself, yeah, raking leaves, organizing the garage, you know, anything that's kind of getting your heart pumping and starting that glistening of sweat that gets you into that moderate intensity, it, it counts. So, you know, some of us are probably doing more than what we think um, just in our, our daily activities. Okay, um, so I focused on a couple specific exercises. So walking, especially if you're new to the exercise regime, walking is always great. Um, and they say, you know, if you're gonna go walk in, try to build it up to doing a 20 to 30 minute walk per day. Outside is always great because it has, you know, no, no matter where you live, it's not gonna be completely flat and straight. You're gonna hit some natural hills, or just turning and all of that is gonna increase your intensity. And yes, you absolutely, I mean, nowadays with technology, um, on treadmills, you can kind of naturally do that. They have different programs that say, I wanna you know, go walk through this park and you know, it adjusts it as needed. Um, but uh, bringing a friend. So I know me personally, I am always trying to uh, walk more. I have um, my Fitbit that I'm always in step challenges with my family and my uncle plays golf like nine days a week. And so he always has a ton of steps. And so I have a friend that I'm like, okay, we're going to walk on the beach, rain or shine, you know, on Mondays and Wednesdays. And when I am feeling lazy and don't want to go, she shows up to my house and she's like, come on, let's go. You said we were going to walk. Um, that or my dog pulls me out of the house. She'll bug me incessantly until we go. Um, but anything you can kind of do to, to get your motivation going so you're more likely to stick to a routine. And then you want to aim to increase your tolerance over time. So keep in mind that light sweat. If you start tomorrow and you are sweating and 20 minutes of walking gets you into that kind of moderate intensity, that's awesome. But if you keep walking every day, most likely three months from now, you can walk that same exact 20 minute route and you're no longer going to be hitting that same intensity because great news, you've improved your health. Um, and so now all of a sudden you need to maybe carry some hand weights or add an extra loop, you know, repeat that loop twice or take the route that has that really big hill that you normally try and avoid. Um, anything to get your heart pumping back up. Swimming is an amazing option um, for people who have limited mobility or joint pain. Um, it's also really great for people who are just getting started that are really significantly overweight because your knees take a brunt of that weight. I mean, all of your joints do. Um, and just the water kind of helps the pressure so you're not putting that pressure on there. Um, and so when I say swimming, it means you could be swimming laps, um, any stroke you prefer, or you could go to a water aerobics class. It doesn't even have to be an organized class. You could just get into the water and do your own exercises, anything that has you moving around. Um, so yeah, um, Linda says 10 minutes of jumping on a mini trampoline is the equivalent of 45 minutes of bike riding. Yeah, um, trampolines are great. And it really makes you realize how much more fit you were as a kid. Um, my cousin's bouncy houses are the same thing. My nieces have a bouncy house um, that my sister bought and they'll blow up. She actually got one that's the perfect size for their basement. So on rainy days or in the winter, they live in Michigan, um, she'll blow it up in the basement. And so I'm like, little kid in me comes out. Oh my goodness, bouncy house. I'm so excited to get in there with my cousins. I don't even think I lasted 10 minutes. I think it was like five minutes. And I'm like, oh my goodness, 
I am out of breath. I'm going to go to the couch. You kids keep jumping and I'll watch you from there. Um, so there are, you know, a lot of kind of unique things that you can do that feel like, you know, it's, it's fun. It's not, you know, in that, oh, I have to go exercise. Um, so Andrea, perfect timing, because as I was typing this slide, I was like, hmm, this doesn't list pickleball, but I feel like pickleball would fall into the same category as tennis, squash, and racquetball. Um, because they are all kind of that low intensity or choose your own intensity game um, that can also be played indoors. So you have no weather constraints. It adds this social aspect to it and stimulates your brain because you have to keep track of the scores and the rules. Um, and again, kind of with the intensity, you don't have to play your heart out. So don't think that you have to go out and play tennis like Serena Williams. You know, you can have a very lower intensity game um, with your friends or, you know, whatever. And then I have to throw out their um, senior fitness programs. So I listed some in our area. I will say, especially with the Senior Resource Center, I know they've attempted, you know, with COVID, exercise programs are one of the biggest things that have taken a hit for us. We offer the sale, the Stay Active and Independent for Life classes through Area One Agency on Aging. And, you know, it was the first thing to shut down in the pandemic. And, it's still, there's one class in Ferndale that, you know, if you're fully vaccinated, they, they have a huge restriction on class size, but they have gone back in person. Everything else is still remote. Um, Humboldt Senior Resource Center, I know they've started to bring back some remote. Um, they're doing some in person if you're part of their day program, but I don't think it's open to the public. Um, but in a normal world, your senior center is a great place to go because they usually always have some exercise class. Um, there's also Tai Chi and bingo size that are offered by public health. I know they were gonna be bringing the bingo size back to in-person. Um, the Tai Chi I think is still online. Um, we actually have DVDs of the Tai Chi. So if it is something that you want at home, I could definitely get you a copy of that. And then I know there's exercise classes offered that kind of change all the time through Ollie. And as Kim mentioned at the beginning of this, you know, they are thankfully going to be start moving towards um, some in person and, and they'd be able to answer better than I can if, if some of those in person are going to be the exercise classes. Um, so public health is offered through the county. So um, it's kind of the Humboldt County Public Health and it, there's a sector of that that focuses on um, health and exercise and things like that. So um, it would be kind of reaching out to the county to figure out their schedule and, and everything. Um, and I believe the Adorney Center is open again. Um, I think most gyms have opened back up. So absolutely, there are, um, you know, programs and exercise classes through the gym. I have never participated in bingo size. It is like the newest hit thing that somehow incorporates bingo with exercise. And don't ask me how they do that. Um, we were looking into, so Phoebe Smith is our physical therapist who kind of oversees the sale classes. And it was something that we, we wanted to start researching and figure out what exactly it was. Um, and then pan the pandemic hit and it was hard enough to kind of figure out sale classes that we didn't branch into it. Um, but I know kind of the, the big thing behind it is it's an exercise, it's a study base exercise. And what that means similar to sale is they have taken people and they've done assessments at the start um, you know, of, of class one. And then they've done studies and, and assessments kind of after so many classes. And so they've been able to kind of correlate the effect of these programs to prove that they really do have a positive effect. And so I know they bingo size has kind of gone through that same regime that the sale program has gone through. Um, and so kind of my, my final closing thing that I've mentioned a few times throughout this is, um, you know, try. Trying can still make a difference. 
you know, people um, who participated in the mind diet, they still showed a decline. Um, so do what you can. Um, exercising, some exercise is better than no exercise. If you've had a bad week, try, you know, try your best. And again, I mean, this is one of the great things about all of these is it's no all or nothing, you know, um, with, you know, keto, I, I attempted to do keto. It's a horrible idea. Um, because it was way too strict for me to follow and you cheat, you eat one, you know, carb and it kicks you out and, you know, you're no longer benefiting from it. And none of these fall into that same category. Um, something is always going to be better than nothing. So with that, if there are any questions that I haven't answered, I am happy. Yes, Lori, go ahead. Um, oh, thanks. Just two quick questions. Um, what compromises sodium? I mean, I think of sodium as salt, essentially, but but I'm wondering if that's just too simple on my part. And but the, the other quick question would be, um, do you think that non-fat dairy is the best option? So, I mean, I, I would say, I, I really don't like, it, it doesn't talk about dairy. Like I said, the mind diet, it, it focuses cheese and butter are bad, but otherwise everything that I've researched doesn't kind of talk about dairy and, and with milk or anything like that. Um, so I would say, you know, with milk, definitely if, if you're doing it for calcium or something like that, um, I mean, it's a, it's a personal preference and, you know, trying to steer clear of the cheese and dairy and, and with cheese, or sorry, not cheese and dairy, cheese and, um, butter with that, I would say, um, non-fat or low fat is grouped the same as full fat with cheeses and butters. So it's, it's trying to limit it regardless. Wow. Okay. Um, oh, and then, sorry, going back to sodium. So yeah, when I say sodium, I do mean salt, um, you know, and that can come there's, you know, naturally saltier things. Um, but for the most part, it means like added salt. So things, um, like potato chips have a lot of sodium in them, things like that. Um, yeah. So Linda saying fat free is never the best option. Um, and that's personally, I agree. I just don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a nutritionist. I have not studied done, you know, done enough studies to really say yay or nay one way or the other. And I, I don't want to point anyone in the wrong direction. Um, but I would say, you know, talk to your doctor is always a good option and say, these are my concerns. This is what I'm wanting to do. What do you recommend? And your doctor knows your medical history. They know, you know, what you can and can't eat. And, you know, they can say, Hey, yeah, seven of those 10 great things you should absolutely eat more of, but I think you should avoid this or regardless of what that says, I think you should still have your glass of milk a day. Any other questions? I think um, just one point is that <clears throat> it depends. The keto diet suggests, for example, that you have full fat dairy <laughs> and that you do have butter and but you always ignore any vegetable oils the oils that are okay include avocado oil in fact you didn't mention avocados but avocado oil as well as coconut oil but that's the keto diet and that is a brain focused diet but it's not necessarily good for everyone and yeah. it's hard to stay in keto if, as you said if you break it <clears throat> The idea behind the keto diet is that if, oh, whoops, um, let me stop that. Megan, it looks like there's a couple of the comments in the, yeah. in the chat. Anyway, uh, some of the rules are simply avoid all processed foods, period, because they all have chemicals that mock or try to recreate food, avoid all artificial anything, sweeteners, yep. dyes, etc. Avoid anything white except cauliflower. Cauliflower yeah. is a good substitute. There's white carrots as well. Well, yeah, but I mean, <laughs> if they're carrots and they're, 
Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, and, and Jamie said the same thing in the comments. You know, there there's a lot, basically things that are not naturally non-fat, which is most processed foods, um, they have to do something or add something to make, to take the fat out. And um, most of the time those chemicals or artificial, whatever that they're throwing in there, you know, are not healthy. And we've seen, you know, if you look through time, society seems to be getting less healthy. And one of the big arguments out there is it's because instead of eating, and, and this is where I mentioned, you know, the difference between butter and margarine. You know, if you think back, like, so my grandma, you know, she ate, she ate butter because margarine didn't exist. And all of a sudden they created margarine and everyone's like, margarine so much better than butter because there's no fat, but there's all these kind of processes that they had to go through to take the fat out of it that now they're saying actually makes it more unhealthy than, than the butter, which has full fat to begin with. Um, Anything hydrogenated. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is not good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Fat has flavor. Um, yeah. So, I mean, keto for my issue with keto is I love bread. I love carbs. And so, and you know, I did, I was really proud of myself because I did pretty good on cutting all of that out, but there's so many things that have natural carbs, like there's certain vegetables. And so what I found was I was eating too many carrots and that was kicking me out of keto. Um, and so for me personally, I found I'm not good with very restrictive diets. I'm not good at having to like, look at all the ingredients before I eat something. Um, I do much better with like a, Hey, eat more vegetables and less processed food kind of diet. Um, but yeah, there's, so, um, Madeline mentions that there's great keto bread recipes. And I will say when I was trying to follow the, the keto, I made, um, a couple different like cookies and things like that. Um, and they, they tasted great. I don't know how healthy they were for me, you know, but everything in moderation. My issue was I made a batch of, of keto cookies and then I ate the whole batch in one sitting. So, you know, it kind of neglects the health benefits. <laughs> Any other questions? I don't know. Did you see in the comments about, um, Bob Bourne's question about what about lots of garlic, like I, in olive oil? Did you see oh, that? Oh, um, yeah. So, I mean, the research I did didn't say anything about garlic. Um, I don't think anyone has ever said a bad thing about garlic. Everything I have ever heard about garlic has been, it's, you know, it's great for your immune system. It's just great in general. So I think adding garlic to olive oil and dipping your bread in that, you know, or, or something to give it flavor. So you're not just dipping in plain old olive oil would be great. Garlic and onions and, and various seasonings are really good for you. Um, regardless of there, there are a whole array of them that you can look up individually to see which ones are, are good for you, but almost all seasonings are, um, and they add flavor to replace the need for sugar mm -hmm. because you get hooked on sugar and your little gut bacteria say, give me more sugar. I want more sugar. Yes. And they, they're basically taught your, your gut microbiome is talking to your brain all the time. And, um, your brain <laughs> is responsive to that. Mm -hmm. Um, so it really matters there. There's some really good, it, it's good to look up all the, various diets and understand what they are and what they aren't. Yeah. Um, and Megan, this has been very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And Andrea mentions um, avocados as a sub for butter. And yeah, I second that, you know, I was not raised in California. So I, I did not eat avocados a lot. When I moved out here, I'm like, Ooh, avocado. I don't know about that. And the first time my friend served me avocado toast, I was like, okay, well, I want to be polite. So I'm going to eat this. And it was delicious. And, you know, no butter needed. You just slather that avocado on, on your toast. And the other thing I think it's important to mention is that 
all fruits, try to make them organic, particularly if you're eating the skins, but definitely berries um, because, and apples and things like that are sprayed and you don't want to be consuming those spray, uh, those chemicals, those pesticides. There is a linkage between those pesticides and things like um, having Parkinson's, for example. Mm -hmm. So anything sprayed, you don't want to consume. Um, so be very careful. You can get organic um, fruits. And I would suggest it's worthwhile paying for the additional fee to do that. Yeah. And I mean, we're lucky enough to live in a climate where berries go grow great. Um, so I know that not all, everyone has the ability to, you know, have a garden or, or anything like that, but blueberry bushes, um, you know, you can have those in a pot on your patio kind of thing. Um, raspberries, blackberries, strawberries. I mean, they're all so easy to grow out here. I am really great at killing things when it comes to gardening and <laughs> I, I'm able to keep my berries alive. So that, that says a lot. And you can go up and, and there are places where there are blackberries growing along the roads. Um, you want something growing too close to the roads because then you're getting all the emissions from the <laughs> cars. But there are lots of places you can find wild blackberries, including in the, in the forest. So and all kinds of berries in the in the community forest. So mm -hmm. that's what the Indians used to get. Yes. Um, and the fatty fish are fabulous. You, I also put in a comment that you can get grass-fed beef, beef, mm -hmm. organic grass-fed beef, and that is also acceptable. Uh, but beef and dairy are generally a problem unless they're um, I mean, even organic milk, they've, they've done studies about the problems of heart disease associated with beef and dairy. Um, Megan, I wanted to circle back to that video that you shared mm -hmm. in the beginning. Uh, one of our participants, Cheryl, found the um, video online and I was going to put it in the chat if that's okay with you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's on YouTube. Um, yeah, that's where she found it. So the, I just put it in the chat. So um, folks, if you want to watch that video, it's there now so that you can go and watch that following the presentation if yeah, you copy that link. Unfortunately, you know, it's, it's a video of like, you can tell it's someone you know, holding their cell phone in the audience. So it's not a great video to begin with. Um, and I mean, I would recommend if you have someone in your family or friends that are dealing with, with memory loss, um, whether it's dementia, Alzheimer's or, you know, whatever, researching Tipa Snow and, and she has material that you can purchase. She has a bunch of different videos and things like that. Um, so it, it might be worth you purchasing it and then you can see that video clip kind of in its whole um, start to finish. <clears throat> and Thank another you. another concept that has been rec uh, considered is that learning languages or a new language doesn't necessarily mean learning a foreign language. <laughs> you might wanna learn physics. You might wanna learn um, biology, uh, microbiology. Uh, you might wanna study climate research. All this incorporates new languages. And, and when you're learning new languages, it creates new synapse. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and I mean, it doesn't even have to be language learning in general, you know, learn geography, um, learn all the capitals of all the, you know, it, and anything that is going to, you know, have you learning and studying something new is, is going to kind of build that same connectivity. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to put a plug in there for Ollie. Um, you know, yes. we have lots of classes and opportunities to learn new things. And we still have, um, I think, eight or 10 more classes starting um, this fall. So go ahead and look online or look on the um, catalog and sign up. We'd love to have you join some of our classes. So thank you. Yeah, thank because you so ever so much for coming and uh, really appreciate it. And feel free to join us again next week. Uh, which is on the Clark Museum, from seeing to doing the Clark Museum at 61 years of age. And the museum uh, 
head, Katie Bush, is going to be exploring how the Clark Museum's approach to public education has changed over the last 60 years, with special focus on how the museum has navigated the pandemic and plans for the future. They've been very active. They've been very active on Zoom, and they're beginning to resume, obviously, uh, in person. So. We'll hope to see you again next week. Thank you to our presenter, Megan. You always do a great job. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again on another topic. Yeah, thanks Thank for Megan. having me. Thank you, Megan. Thanks so much. Thanks, Megan. Thank Did you. you have anything else to add? It's, I thought you were gonna say one more thing there. Um, oh, with, with Ollie. Yeah, I was just gonna support that plug <laughs> um, to say that learning, is usually easiest or best helps you stay on track and actually do it if you join a class, um, you know, and regardless of what that topic of the class is. Otherwise, it becomes one of those things that you're like, I'm going to learn Spanish tomorrow, um, you know, and tomorrow is always a day away. So, you know, when you sign up for a class, you, you're on a timeline. Thank you again. Thanks everybody for being here and I look forward to seeing you uh, in, a, in an Ollie class soon. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Have a good day. Take care.